Okay. So, <clears throat> um, I don't know if we need to, if we have a bunch of people come in, brother uh, Painter, I'll send you the host, but I think most people's on by now. <laughs> I've been upside down all day, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, in the third chapter of, of uh, Corinthians, the sec second Corinthians 3 um, is where we're at here. And I, I, um, I wanted to um, go over this because I think uh, there's, a, there is a, there's a scripture component pertaining to the context that Paul's talking about here that I feel like that not only most people in religion misinterpret this scripture, but I think most, most people in the body do. So I thought it was just something that would be good to correct in your minds. I think if I show it to you, you'll probably see it. Um, and then maybe there may be an, uh, another uh, subject if we have time that I might say something about. But anyway, I want to read here in, in 2 Corinthians 3. I'll just start in the first verse. It says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we or some other, or as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Uh, what Paul's talking about right there, he, he goes through it a lot more in, in, in the previous chapter, but there, there's, there's several spirits in the Corinthian church that are belittling Paul and putting themselves on the same level that he's on. And so he, he's asking, you know, do I need to, you know, do I need to lift myself up to you to prove to you who I am is what he's really saying that he, he tells them, you know, uh, it's foolish what I'm doing, but I'm, but, but for your sakes, I'm doing it. Anyway, that's what he's talking about there. Uh, and then he, he says in verse two, you're our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. In other words, Paul planted everything that was in his heart in them and men that um, are around them are able to see uh, the character of Paul through them. Anyway, verse three says, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficient, sufficiency is of God, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, that's the law, written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? Or if the ministration of condemnation, which is the law be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excel us. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. That's just Paul's way of saying, you know, if, if there was a glory in the law of God under the old covenant, how much more is the glory of the new covenant that's in Christ. And he's even making a statement here that there wasn't any glory in that, not compared to the, not compared to grace. Uh, 
verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face for that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now he's going back and showing how when Moses was went up on the mount and got the Ten Commandments, he was up there for 40 days and nights. When he came down off the mountain, his face shone with such glory that they couldn't look on him. Um, Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. In other words, there was such a glory of God that gave him the Ten Commandments. Uh, and uh, what all God gave him in the pattern on the mount, um, that's, that was abolished in Christ. Christ fulfilled the law, and of course, we're not under the law anymore. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Um. You know, uh, so here uh, he's just showing that it was their minds that were blinded uh, because they just weren't spiritual enough to receive the things that Moses received of God on the mount. And, uh, and then he says, Unto this day it remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Okay, so uh, and, and what he's leading to here is is even the Jews still had a veil on their face. Once once you see Christ, that veil's taken away. Now. Verse 16 says, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of, of the Lord is, there is liberty. Um, and this is not uh, per, the particular verse I'm talking about, but we'll add this to it. I know all of you have heard, you know, that quotation, people quote this verse, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But it's normally always quoted out of context. Is that, that scripture right there has nothing to do with, uh, you know, us being, a, a, us having a liberty of whatever you want to apply it to. I mean, you could use it in application, but the context of this, what he's saying is, is that the Jews are under the bondage of the law because of their unbelief. Now, when, when you see Christ and accept Christ, that, that bondage is done away with you. You're set at liberty of the law, and you come under grace. That's what that scripture is talking about, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So uh, once we, uh, once God's touched us and we have a, a heart to, um, and, and have received Christ and have faith, then uh, then we do see the Lord and, and the glory we're, we're, we're changed. We're being changed in the same image that he's in from glory to glory as we develop in Christ. Um, okay, so I read that chapter to give you a background, to give you a, a context of what Paul's talking about here concerning the fact that Israel didn't see Christ. They didn't accept him. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. There was a there's a veil over their face. 
even when uh, when Paul wrote this, they they didn't they couldn't see that he was the Messiah, and therefore they, you know, that veil was still on their fa- on their heart because they were still in bondage to the law, and they wouldn't they they couldn't accept Christ, and they couldn't see him in the law. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our history gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. I don't know how many uh, of y'all have known people that's been in this body. Uh, And then for whatever reason, they left. And at one time, they may have had a, a great vision. They may have, you know, really been annoying uh, and understanding uh, the purpose of God and the plan of God and the, the the teachings of the body of Christ. But after they left the body, they went blind again. They lost, they lost every bit of that. Uh, you know, I was, there was a, I, I mean, I'm not going to mention any names here, but there was a, a lady that was very, uh, dedicated in the body several years ago that left the body and she was actually elated it seemed like uh, and wrote it on the internet of how excited she was that her son had grown up and, and left the home, home to move in with his sweetheart not married. I mean, <laughs> you know what? I mean, most people, even in the world, would want to tell that, much less broadcast it. But it just shows you how much she lost or what she had. Um, but here, that's what he's saying. Um, verse three. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And of course, he's actually referring probably more to Jews than anyone else here. Now, this fourth verse is the verse that I'm wanting to talk about. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. At least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh, Most people interpret this scripture, the God of this world, that phrase as being sin. Some people interpret interpret it the devil. But uh, look at this word God here. It's a, it means divinity. It's the exact same word that is always interpreted, capital G-O-D, God. Uh And that's what I'm telling you. The God of this world is God, the Father, God Almighty. That should be a capital G. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. uh, I'm already gave you a context to show that the children of Israel, because of unbelief, they were blinded. God actually. What scripture does it say that? Let's see if we can go back up and get a, there's a scripture I'm wanting to go back to. Um,
Give me just a second here, I'll find it. Is it verse 14 in chapter three? Oh verse yeah, 14? their minds yeah. were blinded for unto this day remain the same veil taken away. For the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Um, I believe it's second Corinthians four, four. That's where you're at. Yeah. No. Uh, but I'm, I was trying to find, I was thinking there was a scripture up there that sort of alluded to the fact that, that it was God. Um, but let me, let me, while, well, I'll, let me look at that. And again, in a minute, let me give you some scriptures here. Let me, I just clicked this up. Can y'all see this little window I clicked up? John 12, 40. It says he hath blinded. Let me let me back up. Verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles, this is John talking about Christ, before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. He's talking about when he saw his train lifted up in the temple. Um, in other words, here he's showing where, where Paul said, God blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Why? Because of unbelief. In other words, uh, God, he, he couldn't take, I mean, uh, let me try to make this clear that, yes, it's because of unbelief and their sin um, in not accepting God, even though God manifested himself in so many ways, but it was God. In other words, God's the one that, that blinds the, eye, the eyes of anyone that will not accept him. I don't think you can make this word, the God of this world, something besides God. Let me give you another scripture uh, in, in Isaiah 29. Here it is. For the Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered, and the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed which men delivered to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray you. It's like the, it's like the book of Revelation that was sealed. God sealed that book. And if, if you didn't, if God didn't touch you, and you didn't open your heart for God to open the seals to you, you, could, you can't see it. It's spiritual. That's why the children of Israel, you know, they wouldn't accept uh, they was they, they were too fearful of God. And they wouldn't go up on the mountain with Moses. And so uh, when Moses came back down, they couldn't receive what Moses gave them from the Lord. So I'm just giving you this scripture. Let's see if what I've got here. Yeah. 
that verse in, in verse three, but if our gospel be hid, that word hid uh, means to cover up, to hide, to hinder the knowledge of a thing. Uh, they, verse in 3.15 Yeah, verse 15, verse uh, chapter three, verse 15 says, but even unto this day when Moses is read and the veil is upon their heart, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So uh, uh, their minds are blinded because of, of unbelief and God in other words, if they won't turn to the Lord in faith, receiving, uh, I mean, here, they see it It certainly looks like in the Old Testament that, that it was a literal, that Moses' face literally had such glory on it that they couldn't look upon him. And he wound up putting a literal veil over his face. And Paul's just going into that to show uh, why they weren't able to receive what Moses had received. It was because of their unbelief. And actually the context of this whole thing is, is the apostle Paul is dealing with the Corinthians, mainly a leadership that has rose up and challenged Paul's authority. And he's letting them know you don't, you can't see you don't see the glory of God that he's worked in you through me because of your heart, because of your unbelief. And I, I, uh, I, re I had that happen in the, in just the last few years, I had a man that I've been working with for over 20 years that never has been able. He's never really truly seen, uh, the, the order of the body of Christ. I've worked with him and worked with him and worked with him. And I, I you know, he's, he's from the Dominican Republic. I finally had to just cut him off because he never obeyed me and it not one thing. And it's because of, it's because of his heart, his heart. He didn't have a heart that was humble enough to receive the things of God. That's what Paul's dealing with here concerning those men. And that's why he's using this allegory or this picture of the Old Testament. But my main reason for talking to y'all tonight about this or mentioning it to you is because I feel like we are, I feel like you ought to know that the God of this world, that there ain't no God of this world outside of Jesus, outside of God the Father and Jesus Christ. The God of this world is, uh, even though the interpreters didn't know what to do with that, and they put a small God there, but God's the one that blinded their light, their minds, uh, least the light of the glory of gospel, whose image of God would shine into them. In other words, um, that we're, this is a spiritual uh, operation of God. And you, uh, how did Paul say it? Neither has entered into the ear hath not heard, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, the things that God's prepared for them that love him. Uh, but it's been revealed to us by the spirit. So in other words, Look at everybody, even in Babylon, you can't, you can't even reach a lot of people because uh, they can't, they're not able to receive uh, what is spiritual. They're too carnal to receive it. And so they, they are established in man's doctrine, man's ideology, but they're not actually receiving the spirit of truth uh, from the Lord that will reveal to them the truth. Anyway, I just wanted to, um, let's see, if we, we want to read, um, 
Verse five, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, our Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God has got commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. But we have this treasure in, in earthen vessels that the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. He, he go, he's still working on the fact that, um, you know, that he's been def, uh, that there's men trying to, uh, bring themselves up on Paul's level or bring him down on their level, one or the other. And he's really working on that spirit of those men in Corinth in the second, in his second letter. And he's still working on that here. But he, again, he uses that. To, he uses uh, this picture in the Old Testament of what took place with the Jews that they weren't spiritual enough to receive what God gave Moses on the, on the mount. And therefore, he had to put a veil on his face. And that's really what he's saying. Uh, if you read the second chapter, I mean, the second book of Corinthians over, you'll see that's what he's working on. And, and uh, he's really showing them that you're, you're not seeing what God gave me to gave, give you. You don't see the authority that God gave me as the apostle over this work. And, uh, and I'm having to go back over and over and tell you all the things that God did that caused him to send me to you and what I've been through as an apostle. And he basically was saying, none of y'all been through any of that. But, but anyway, my main point here is just to bring it to your attention, this phrase, the God of this world. Again, John 12 says, he, talking about God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see. There's also, I think, a scripture. I might be able, let me see if I can. Uh, Brother Smith, would you consider Second uh, Thessalonians 2.11 in that same vein? where he says he gave them a strong delusion. Yeah, I think you would have to, uh, of course, this second chapter of Thessalonians, Paul is dealing with the, Thessal the church in Thessalonica. Um, and, of course, the setting of that is that... Um, in the second chapter of Thess Second Thessalonians 2, where he said, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And of course, here's what he's telling them. Don't let anybody tell you Jesus is fixing to come, not in the Gentile world. It's a little bit, uh, if you don't understand you know, like in the book of James, James was talking to the Jews and he told them uh, the day of the Lord is at hand. He's coming soon. Here Paul saying he ain't coming. Don't, don't even think that he's fixing to come. He's not coming until there's a falling away. What's the difference? He was coming in AD 70 to judge the Jews. And that's what James was talking about. But here in Second Thessalonians, he's talking to an all-Gentile church, and he's telling them, don't let anybody tell you Jesus is fixing to come because he's not going to come except there be a falling away first. 2,000 years ago that it was going to fall away, which it did do. Then, and, of course, uh, when he says, 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He's talking about the Pope of Rome there, of the Catholic Church, which was 300 years down the road from when Paul said this, but he was prophesying. Then verse four, he says, who opposes and exalted himself above all that's called God or that's worshiped so that he as God sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the Catholic Church says. The Pope's infallible. He can't make a mistake. He just like God, sitting in the temple of God in God's stead. Verse five, remember you not when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and know ye now what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, this falling away has already started. We're already having trouble. He, he mentioned to the church in, uh, in Ephesus, which was a Gentile church. He said, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, spoil men of your own selves, spoiling the flock. Uh, he was showing them, you know, when he departed, that the church was going to wind up in a bad condition. Um, uh, okay, so then he says in verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed, talking about the Pope of Rome, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Now that, that is a, a restored church ministry. This God is going to consume or destroy that system with the spirit of his mouth, which is his ministry restored down here. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. See, he's he's coming back uh, in a brightness. In other words, he's going to reveal himself completely with a sevenfold light. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, but they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, so uh, here, this is talking about when the beast speaks down here, that uh, coming after the workings of Satan with powers, lying wonders, that's the image of the beast that will be set up down here in the end of this world. And at that time, the church will also be restored, and God will, with his ministry, uh, defeat that system for his people. The, the multitude of Babylon will be destroyed in judgment, just like the multitudes of the Jews were destroyed in AD 70's judgment. It'll be Armageddon down here. But now, here, let's read 10 and 11, Brother Painter was bringing up this fourth, uh, ver, uh, this 12th verse. And 11 says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. So God the way God's going to send them strong delusion is by the beast system. In other words, everyone that does not, everyone that does not uh, accept the body of Christ and the uh, manifestation of the Lord uh, in his coming. That's where everyone needs to understand the coming of the Lord. He's not coming to catch his church away like the, world teaches, he's coming to us exactly like he came in the end of that Jewish world. He came to the church. He, he, it was a 45-year period of his coming. The Lord's coming is two, it's a 30-year and a 15-year period. And uh, God harvests the world in that coming. He'll come in a restored ministry just like he came on the day of Pentecost and the 12 apostles. And they it was a 45-year period that they harvested the end of the Jewish world, and God finished that harvest 
in AD 70, destroying Israel and the temple. And, and uh, he left the Jews and went to the Gentiles and started all over with a new 2000 year world. But this is talking about this 10, 11th and 12th verse in the end of our world, God will send strong delusion. Look how God did it back there. God sent false, false prophets. Judaism was strong and was against the body of Christ and fought the body of Christ, would not receive anything. And God used that to gather up uh, all those that were in unbelief. That's what, the, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said uh, God would send angels to gather up the tares. Let's say something I hear about tares. Uh, tares, there a lot of people get tares confused with chaff. Uh, chaff is part of the it's part of the wheat stalk. That you know that in other words that's part of the whole growth of wheat that comes up, and finally in harvest time it produces the grain. But the grain's what we're after, not the stalk. After it's harvested on the thrashing floor, they thrash out the chaff and only keep the grain because that's that's the that's the harvest of wheat. The chaff has done its job. You you're you are human, uh, and even though you're in a fallen nature of Adam. You've been born again, and God's going to produce, we're going to use that allegory, God's going to produce a harvest or wheat out the seed out of you when he finishes his work in you, and he's going to do away with the chaff. You're going to die. Your body is going back to dust, but God will speak you into a new existence, a new body and for throughout eternal life, and so uh, that's the chaff is, you know, I mean, right now we got, we got chaff among us, but God's producing us to a full wheat that he'll separate us from that, from the chaff in the end. That has nothing to do with, with tares. Tares, if you remember, Jesus was telling his disciples, uh, he's giving them that parable and he was saying, you know, uh, the husbandman uh, that had planted the wheat, his servants came to him and said, there's tares in the field. And he said, the enemy did this. And, and that's what enemy in the early church was all of those Judaizers that would not accept Christ and didn't believe and didn't have faith to believe. And, uh, and they were, and, and, and he's, they said, you know, the, do you want us to pluck these tares up? He said, no, if you do, you're going you're gonna to destroy some of the wheat because tares look just like wheat, but they never produce, they don't, they don't produce anything in harvest. They don't, they, they're not wheat at all, and they're not even part of it. So he said, in the end, he said, wait, in the end of the world, gather the tares up. And, 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 and then put them in bundles and burn, we'll burn the tares and then we'll gather the wheat. Well, that's what happened in the end of the Jewish world. All of those Judaizers, false prophets that, that rose up against the body of Christ, they did a work that harvested it. it they gathered all the people that were non-believers. They didn't believe in Christ or his body. And so God, God had someone that would, that would, um, how does it say here in verse 11, send them strong delusion. In other words, they, they believed in God. They believed in Judaism. They, they were under a strong delusion that all of those non-believers of the body of Christ were saying, 
you know, this is the truth. Don't believe in G the Messiah. They're calling Jesus Christ. They're calling Messiah. They was against that. That's what John said, that anyone that didn't believe that Jesus had came in the flesh, that the Son of God had came in the flesh was the Antichrist. Well, that was a strong delusion back there. This word, I'm, I'm using this as to what happened back there. But here in verse 11, God is going to send strong delusion down here. We're going to, we are going to gather the restored church and gather all of God's people that can receive Christ. That, and, and look, everybody says they've received Christ in Christianity. Well, but they don't, you know, they, they, they don't believe in the Christ that, that we're preaching. And therefore they're, they're, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that deception will take place where, where Babylon will, will all join together in the, the mark of the beast. Uh, will be set up, and God will get who he can get out of Babylon that will become a part of the body, which it will be a great number, but it will be a, a small number compared to the whole. And uh, there will be, they will, they will rise up against the body of Christ, bring the same persecution that, in, in type that, that the early church had persecution from Judaism and Rome and all of those that joined that religious system back there that was against the body of Christ, that'll happen again down here. And that's the strong delusion that it's, Paul's talking about here, that in the same way, they've got a veil over their face, in, in a not in the same application, because we can't use what Moses did with the children of Israel to show that these down here have a veil over their face because it, I mean, they do have, but it's not, we can't use Moses to show it because it's not, we're not talking about Jews or that particular picture, but it, we can apply it and show that God, God is sending strong delusion, which I, I think that's a very good verse you brought up, Brother Painter, that, that, um, we, you know, this is, this, this, uh, applies very much that God is sending strong delusion in the same way that the God of this world blinded their eyes back there. He used uh, he used fault he used those that were in falsehood and let them gather up. See, it wasn't it wasn't the apostles in the end of that world that gathered up of all the false believers of of Judaism, but it was all of those false leaders that God used and let them gather. He didn't destroy them. God could have destroyed that if he wanted to, but he doesn't do that. God lets man, he gives us a free will and he does not force himself on anybody. And so he just allows, God's one responsible for it, but it's a man that he allowed because of their disbelief. So I hope I'm making some sense to you to the fact that um, that that in in Second um, uh, Corinthians four and four that the God of this world is talking about God Himself, God the Father, not not sin or some uh, spirit that's in this world. Uh, uh, but that he is refer he's referring to God there. And I think most people look at that. In fact, I've talked to several ministers, even in the body, that think the God of this world is sin. Uh, but when you when you look at all these scriptures, I talked to a minister in the body one time about it. I explained this to him. He said, I see what you're saying. He said, I never looked at the context of it like that. I just looked at the scripture, you know, that uh, the God of this world, and you're almost splitting hairs, you know, 
it, it, it's almost like splitting hairs uh, because it is their unbelief that drew them away. But it's not a spirit, and it is a spirit that's in the world. But, but that scripture or that phrase that says the God of this world that blinded the, their eyes is talking about God. It, you, can't, you can't make that into something besides God. It's just, it's just too emphatic that that's the context of what he's talking about. So um, I was going to, there was just a couple of things that I was thinking that I might just say, you know, just trying to maybe correct a couple of scriptures or a few scriptures that had always been alluded to in the wrong way. Um, there was another scripture. And I, to be honest with you, I got in here early and I was going to kind of look at it. And I couldn't get my camera to work. And I was, uh, I like to never got it going. Um, let me see if I can find this other scripture. We don't have much time left. If there's any questions or uh, uh, comments, you feel free. Brother Smith, I have a question. Uh huh. There's been people uh, that have been in this body. Well, let's say my children. Um, and they were serving the Lord. And I, I felt that Lynn's, well, my daughter, at least I felt had a revelation of something, but then they're gone and now they're out in the world and they're believing in God where they're at, but they're not believing in, in order and seeing the order or anything now because they've, what's happened to them over the years. Has God blinded their eyes, or or is or do you think he those kind of people that he can do something with in the end times when they're calling when he says come come out of her my people? Okay, let me let me try to elaborate a little bit on on what I'm meaning about what I'm saying about God blinding eyes. Okay. Um. I don't think God deliberately looks at someone and says, I'm just going to blind you because you're not, you don't have faith. It's just, this is part of God's, it's part of God's natural law. In other words, God, if you don't have it work, there's carnal, carnal minds and spiritual minds. And when you lose your spiritual mind, you go back into carnality and Man has a great influence on you. People that leave the body that at one point accepted and had faith in a measure, and then they go back in the world and the world affects them, they begin to look at things carnally. They, they're not looking at things spiritually anymore. They gave that up because of some, they may be victims, they may have been hurt, they may have just been rebellious. That, you know, whatever reason, it, I mean, there's, there's, there's people that left the body because they were hurt. There's people that, uh, there's people that, you know, their loved one died and they, they actually got mad at God, and turned away from God because of it. They didn't get enough understanding to realize, you know, that they had to accept whatever God did and realize it was the best. Uh, so, I'm not saying that God looks at someone and says, I'm just going to zap you with blindness. I do think God might would do that on exceptional cases uh, because they may hinder. If there's somebody that's hindering God's work and hurting one of his little ones, he may, he may deal specifically with them. But in a general sense, God is not just saying, you know, I'm going to blind this person. But, but God's responsible for the fact that uh, he, can't, he can't open their eyes because they don't have faith to open their eyes for him to touch. And therefore, you might even say he, he lets them go blind or he leaves them blind. 
if they never did have sight. So I don't think, you know, like for an example, uh, I mean, I know something about, let's just say your children. Uh, I don't think God deliberately blinded them. I think that because of what they, some things that they went through that was hurtful to them, I think that they turned away from the body because they went through some painful things. And when they did that, they, they lost what spiritual mind they had and they went back to the way the world looks at things. And they just, and right now they may be in a place where they're not, uh, they're not willing to open their hearts and their minds because they don't want to get hurt again. That's what happens to people a lot of times. So some of this is going to have to be dealt with in a restored church when God manifests himself more or in a resurrection. But uh, if they're God's children, they're going to come up in the resurrection one way or the other, either the just or the unjust resurrection. It depends on what God's able to do with them, uh, you know, before they die in this life. So I don't think, just like I was showing how these people who are uh, who God sends strong delusion. Now, one of the things you got to look at that, you're talking about in judgment in the end of a world after God has manifested himself fully and people reject that. Then I think God turns them over and says, you know, I'm just going to let you go the way of the beast. I've tried. I've done everything I know to do to save you, and you won't. You will not open your heart and be saved. And therefore, he allows this delusion or or falsehood to overtake them because of the spirit that they're in. He really can't. He really can't do anything with them. They've already. Uh, it's like, for an example, when you look at Judas that betrayed Christ, you wonder how. How could this man turned against Christ after all he saw, felt, and what was done before him? Yet, uh, yet he he betrayed the Lord. It's just hard. Sometimes it's hard to fathom that a man, that a man that was firsthand like him. And of course, I'm not putting anybody else in his place. I'm just showing you how a person can have a mind that no matter what they see, they cannot, God cannot pull their mind away from carnality and get them uh, to receive the truth. And so, yes, God's responsible, but I'm, I'm not trying to make you think God's going around just blinding people because they, won't, they don't have faith. They, they're already blind, you know, and uh, but God's responsible for that's what I'm trying to say is uh, because a person don't have faith, God has blinded their minds, not when they became blind, he blinded their minds in the way that he set up spirituality and carnality. The way that man's carnality went, God has withheld truth from the carnal mind. And if, if God can't touch you, he can't help you. And, and I'm just saying God is the one responsible for that, but it's certainly not the way he wants it. Um, Brother Smith. Okay, here's a other. Yes, sir. Um, in that same chapter of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, we all obviously have a, a responsibility to not have pleasure in unrighteousness, which is the 12th verse that he, he mentioned there. But it does appear that the writer gives us hope um, in the 15th verse, even if we find ourselves in a moment of blindness. If we, I ask you to consider this. I understand the, the beginning of the chapter he's talking about the falling away of the church. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the fall, but if to apply it to us today, it looks like he gives us kind of a backstop. If we find ourselves in a moment of blindness, that we could stand fast and hold the traditions that we've been taught. I think 
probably one of the weaknesses that people have when they leave the body is they don't, they get offended, but then they turn loose of the good too. They, they, it's like they turn loose of everything. Instead of holding fast to the good that they receive, they kind of let it go as well. Yes, I, I, um, you know, I think, I, I just believe that God understands people. He understands their weaknesses. He understands where they're at. And even if they fall or leave the body, I, they're God's children. I don't think he ever quits dealing with them. He, he said he would never leave you, leave them, even to the end of the world. God will always try to find a way to save, you know, like uh, when it, uh, uh, he, he will, he will fan a smoking flax and he'll, he'll try to heal a, a broken reed. In other words, he, he'll do what he can do to save his children. He sometimes lets them go. I, I think the wisdom of God, like I was telling you about this, young, this man that never has worked right with me and I've been working with him for over 20 years. And I finally cut him off. He came back to me and begged me if he could come back. And I said, no, I won't accept you back. You've done too much. But I did that um, because I feel like he needs to, he needs, I, if, if I accepted him back, he'd do the same thing he's always done. And so I just felt like I'm going to cut you loose. I'm going to let God deal with you. And, and hopefully God will take you through some things that will humble you that, that you can come back right. When I see you come back in the right spirit, I'll accept you. But he wasn't in the right spirit, and he never has been. And so, you know, sometimes that's hard, but I think God does that. God, I think God, sometimes he'll let you go, and he'll let you go out in the world, and he'll let you get so so sick of the world that he can save you. That's his whole purpose of letting you go. And hopefully, just like the the rich man, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, what's the parable I'm wanting? The prodigal son. With the, huh? The prodigal son. Yeah, the prodigal son. That, this that that man never did go hunting him down like you know, which is a picture of God didn't go you know what doesn't necessarily go hunt you down, but he let that young man get in such a condition that he said, "Hey, if I can just go home be a servant in my father's house, I'd be better. I'd be better off what I am now." But when he went home with the right spirit, humble down, you know, they killed the fatted calf, gave him the ring of sonship, and. And uh, was far greater than what he ever imagined. And God will do the same thing. So, yes, I think there's always hope for God's children. Uh, I even think there's hope for people that's been uh, influenced by God's people but never have really come to God. I still think God sees those people. And if there's anything in their heart that he sees could possibly be saved, he'll, he'll He'll deal with them. He'll work with them. He'll try to help them. Um, this other scripture, I'm going to give you this scripture, and we may talk on it later more, but in Hebrews 10, uh, and I've mentioned this one time, I believe, in Bible study at, in the church, and verse 16 Wait a minute. No, that verse 19 is the one I want. Hebrews 10, verse 19 said, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Um, I, I want to. I want to help you with verse 19, two, two of these words. Number one, boldness. I don't think we ought to be using boldness. I don't think the interpreter's got the right word there. 
I think the right word is either assurance or confidence. Having therefore, brethren, assurance. I don't think anybody ought to have boldness to rush in. And here it says the holiest place, and it does not mean the holiest place. Again, the interpreters didn't know the difference between the holiest and the holy, holy place. Let me show you this word right here. I'm going to click on it. It is interpreted, look, sanctuary 11 times, holy place four times. I mean, three, uh, I'm sorry, sanctuary four times, holy place three times, and holiest of all three times, and holiness one time. Here it should have been interpreted holy place. See, there, there's a, in other words, there's an outer court of the temple. There's a holy place, which is second heaven, and a holiest, uh, uh, the holy of holies, the holiest. To enter in that place is to enter in the eternal life. Here, Paul's talking about, uh, here he's talking about, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Uh, he, he's really talking about having the assurance that we can enter in to a holy, the holy place, a place of perfection. The holiest, you know, we, number one, I don't think we ought to be using the word boldness anyway, I think it ought to be assurance or confidence that we can enter into the holy place. The holiest is where God and Jesus and the holy angels are. And uh, here what Paul's talking about, uh, verse 13, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. In other words, when you go out of the outer court into the holy place, that's the first veil. Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart of full assurance. There's that word. I wonder if that's the same word, 4136. No, it's a little different word. Uh, assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession. See, here, he, he's just talking about that while we're alive, that we can with boldness enter into the holiest. Uh, while we're alive, you, you may enter into the holy place, but you're not getting into the holiest while you're alive. That, that's the finished work after you've already in, inherited eternal life. Uh, Again, that word is interpreted both ways, holy place and holiest. Uh, and it's not the only it's not the only place that the interpreters did that. Um, I might not be able to find it right now. Um, see in verse uh, in chapter nine, it says, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. There he's talking about the holy place and the holy of holies of the temple. He didn't go into that natural, literal temple, which are figures of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, nor yet that he should off, offer himself often is the high priest entered into the holy place every year. That should be the holy of holies. The high priest entered into the holy of holies every year uh, and made atonement for man's sins. See, and that, so here then the, the, uh, the translators are a little bit, I think, confused concerning the holy place and the holy of holies because in the Greek, it's interpreted both ways. Um, so I just thought I'd bring that to your attention because I hate for people to read that uh, 
you know, that number one, I don't like, I don't like the way the interpreters put boldness in the 19th verse. It kind of reminds me, you know, of, of uh, how's it say barging in where angels tre tread to fear to tread. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think anybody ought to be very bold about trying to get into the holy place or the holy of holies if they, well, I don't even, you know, I mean, I think with assurance or confidence that we can make that with God's help, you could consider the holy, so that's not the context of what he's talking about here. Anyway, I'm just going to bring that to your attention so that you know, maybe in your mind, you could get that uh, a little bit adjusted, the, the, the use of the word boldness and the holy, the holiest. I think that certainly should be the holy place. Anyway, that's not a great big issue, but I just thought I'd mention it to you. Uh, okay, let me, there's a couple prayer requests here. Um, of course, I don't know. I haven't heard a report um, of Brother uh, and what's Amber's daddy's name? Yeah, Brother Buddy Case. He's really doing better. Um, he's improving, but he's in the hospital. Uh, I think he had had a stroke that affected his his brain some but he is improving uh we're praying for him and he was he used to be in the church in little rock he's a great guitar player and you know, he's been out of church a long time but i think it's a good time for us to pray for him uh, you know uh my wife uh her her beautician is buddy's wife amber and no. His daughter. His daughter. I mean, I didn't mean his wife. I knew it was his daughter, Amber. Anyway, if you'd pray for Brother Buddy Case, and then, of course, Sister Crow, we want to keep praying for her. Sister Julie Crafton, Brother Weaver. I haven't heard a new report on Brother Weaver in the last two days either. They were going to take him off. He woke up. They thought they were going to get him off of the ventilator, but he's back. then they put him back on it. But I haven't heard anything since then. Um, so something I need to check on. Sister Cindy and Michael are in Fort Worth. They're having their mother's uh, memorial service. Aunt Cindy's mother, Sister Angie Elder, of course, for those of you who didn't know, passed away. Um, um, that's my son and daughter-in-law, for those of you that don't know. Uh, let's see. We need, brother, brother yes, Brother Lewis's grandson and Brother Lewis, the pastor in Norfolk, Virginia Church, body in the body. His five-year-old grandson has got tuberculosis, and it's the bad. It's the worst kind. And he's, he's leukemia. leukemia. I didn't mean tuberculosis. Leukemia. And he's already taking uh, chemotherapy, and he's really been in a lot of pain. He needs a miracle. We need to keep him in prayer. And then I'm asking everybody to keep praying for Bill Daniels, Brother Daniels. Is, he just cannot. We just haven't been able to see him rise up above this taking on water and heart congestion in his body. And I think we need to keep praying for him. Uh, I'm asking God to he, he Brother Daniels. I don't want to lose Brother Daniels. And you know, of course, I'm not trying to go against God, God's will, but I, if, if it's in God's will to heal him, I'm asking, I'm like the little widow. I'm not leaving the Lord alone about this. Hell, I know the Lord, you know, if God talked to me, I would, but pray for Brother Daniels. Um, what else? Somebody else got Brother brother Goss. And uh, what's his condition, Sister McNabb? It's pretty well much the same right now. He's still in the home. Um, 
he's not ready to come out of there yet. Um, we're yeah. not getting a lot of updates on him right now, but I, I think that means he's basically the same right now. Okay. Well, we certainly need to keep praying for Brother Goss. And it's also family. the condition over in southwestern Haiti where this earthquake was. Uh, they're basically that area is that it's it's centrally localized in that area, but that area is basically destroyed. And and we've got several churches in that area that were destroyed, and we're having a hard time getting help to those people because the gangsters have taken over all the roads in and out of that area and they're stopping every car and robbing everybody of everything they got because they know people trying to take water and food and money into that area. And so uh, it's very dangerous over there right now. And so uh, I have, I, I, you know, I got some help to one family in this past week. Uh, that's not right in that particular area, just on the outskirts of it, but they were able to get get far enough out of that town that we could get some help to them. So anyway, keep praying for Haiti. It's, you know, they've just been through so much. Um, I know I'm leaving somebody out, but I'm, I didn't Brother have Smith, anything. Yes. I'd like to request prayer for our uh, veterans, particularly veterans of the Afghan war. There's a lot of mental anguish that they're experiencing right now, reliving things that they've experienced as well as uh, PTSD and so forth. Yes, and also the condition with those that are still there in Kabul. They were 12 of our servicemen killed today with a suicide bomber. And I don't know how many Afghanistans were killed, but uh, I know there were several. So, the, you know, we need to pray for that condition. Uh, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders, you know, our kings and, and uh, government. So we need to do that. This, mention, this meeting coming up in the convention center, you know, I'm concerned about COVID, you know, how much we ought to be coming together right now. You know, we're just trying to be prayerful about to the Lord about what to do about all of this. Um, let's see, I had somebody else in my mind. Um, oh, it was in my mind there to, to mention somebody. Oh, Brother Mark Boyd. Brother Mark Boyd's father, of course, recently passed away, and his mother is, uh, they both had COVID, so she's over it, but he's needing to go to Springfield this coming weekend and and check on things, so pray for Brother Boyd and his family. Brother Durham, uh, Brother Sister Durham, Brother Matt and Reva and their family, and Jacob and Terry and their family are all on vacation uh, right now. So pray for them that they'll have a good, good time and safe trip. Uh, so, all right. If everybody could, if you would, uh, let's all unmute our phones and pray together. Uh, if you unmute your cameras, I mean, yeah. Oh, pray and ask God to meet these needs. Precious Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Help us, oh God. Precious Lord. Jesus Christ. Oh, your word for my Our help is coming great position, Lord. God, for brother. Meet the needs of Jesus. Dear brother. And uh, have such a need for brother, touch, brother, natural touch, for brother, healing, Christ. oh God, miracles, even Those this child, Virginia, God, touch Brother Daniels tonight, uh, uh, brother, Lord, Lord, sister, 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 Lord God, thank you, Lord. help thank us, Lord, Lord. brother, and church is there, your precious saints. 
I told you. I said, Lord, oh God. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for your goodness. Your kindness of your people today. We just ask you to help us. That's Brother Cross, the church in Keswick. Precious Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. our service. Glory. Glory. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. All right. God bless your hearts. Thank you for being with us tonight, everyone. And by the way, I wanted to mention Brother Wallace. I see Brother Wallace is on. He's been getting on with us. We, we've been missing you, Brother Wallace. Thankful. Good to see you, though. All right. God bless your hearts. We're praying for you. We're praying for y'all in Keswick. Thank you. All right. God bless everyone. God bless. Have a good night. I'll see good those night, everybody. Good to see you, Brother Wallace. Sunday. All right. God bless. Good night. Good night. Let's see. In the end, I got to stop the recording. I'm going to